Fall is probably one of my favorite seasons, but it is also a very busy time here on the homestead. Preserving season is in full swing now that the weather is cooling down and we still have so many projects we need to get done before winter arrives. If you're new here, I'm Stacy, homeschooling and homesteading mama of seven on a mission to ditch the grocery store and become more self-sufficient. Subscribe to our channel to learn more about our journey and how we were making that dream come true. Currently, we are switching gears from our laid back summer to our regular routines and homeschool schedule. Along with getting into our new rhythms this week, I wanna cozy up the farmhouse with some minimalist approved fall decor. But before I do that, I need to do a few projects to get things cleaned up around here. Come along with me as I do some harvesting, some preserving projects, home projects, and decorate the farmhouse so that it feels cozy for fall. When it comes to fall preserving, I feel like I'm a nurse on a war battlefield triaging my patients. I have to figure out what needs my attention the most. Is it the pears that are growing softer by the minute or the peppers that are past their prime? I try to just do one thing every day through the busy time and hope that it all gets done. Here, I'm gathering squash that needs to be brought in for curing. I usually just put them in my entryway until they are completely dry before bringing them down to the cellar for winter. There, they will stay good for 2 to 12 months depending on the type. For example, acorn squash tend to go bad the quickest, while butternut and spaghetti squash easily last until spring, if not longer. Then, I need to get the remaining tomatoes and peppers from the garden. Peppers get chopped and frozen, dried or canned. And then with the tomatoes, I just wash them, dry them, cut off any bad spots, and throw them into freezer bags. Unless I'm making something like salsa or something where I'm going to be using them right away. This way, I can freeze them until all the tomatoes are ready to process at once and the busy preserving season is winding down, allowing a little more time in my schedule. Last weekend, we butchered our meat birds, so next up, I'm working on making a batch of broth and getting the chicken in the freezer. We don't freeze many of the birds whole because this isn't how we typically use them, so instead, I part out the birds and then use the carcasses to make broth. For whole birds, I use shrink wrap bags, but then for the parts, I just vacuum seal them into meal-sized portions for our family. This makes defrosting chicken for meals later much easier. The nice thing about making broth is that it isn't a very hands-on project. I just add a few carcasses to each of my slow cookers, or you can do this in a pot on the stove too. Then I add some carrots, onions, celery, and a few bay leaves. Next, you just let it cook on low for 12 to 24 hours. I will say that there is a lot of controversy around how long broth should cook, but my broth is always the most gelatinous and flavorful if I let it go for the full 20 to 24 hours, so that's what I do. We also have wild grapes that are ready to harvest, so while the broth is cooking and the sun is out, we're going to go pick them. We look forward to this each year. These grapes are on our property but a ways from the house, so when we found them, it was like finding gold. The bummer with wild grapes is that the vines just climb the trees, so a lot of the best fruit is up pretty high. Someday I'd like to plant some grapes by our orchard, but for now the kids are just enjoying the challenge of figuring out how to get all the grapes. All right, hold on, Nina's gonna throw me. Okay, ready? Throw them. Okay, go put it in there. Okay, put them in the bucket. At one point I even let them climb up on our van because once you see a beautiful cluster of grapes just out of reach, it's really hard to pass them by. These grapes supposedly were originally brought from Finland by the homesteaders who used to own this property. We actually refer to this area of our property as the homestead because it's where the old home sat up until about 15 years ago when it was taken down and buried. It is really fun to come out here and see things like the old clothesline or find old jars and tools. That's cool. Old clock. The descendants of that family huh. stop by yeah. every year during their family reunion and have told us a is lot about the history it? of this property as well, which I find so fascinating. Once we thought we got all that we could manage to reach, it was time to bring them up to the house and prep them for juicing. We learned the hard way that you should actually remove the stems because they contain tannins which affect the taste and quality of the juice. Not to mention it makes the juicing process much faster if you do. So we washed the grapes, removed their stems, and then added them to the juicer. This is a steam juicer and basically it works by boiling water in the lower chamber which creates steam that then juices whatever fruit is in the top basket. So the steam cooks the fruit down, and then as the juice section fills up, it comes out of this hose, 
and then we collect it directly into the jars we plan to can it in or in a pot if I plan to make grape jelly right away. Today I'm going to do a bit of both. After we've gone through all of the grapes, there's just the pulp left, which our chickens gladly eat, and then I will just can these jars. Now I have, and I know many people who do just let the hot juice fill the jars, add the lids and bands, and call it done. It is hot enough to seal the lids just fine, and I think that's probably fine. I just feel better about throwing them in the canner for a few minutes to verify that everything got hot enough to not worry about them going bad. Probably just a silly rule following thing given how hot they are when they're done, but I've realized a mental piece is worth 10 minutes of my time, so do whatever you feel comfortable with. Grape jelly is very easy to make and we enjoy eating it all winter long. I do a low sugar recipe, so I use Pomona's pectin to do this. If you're using regular pectin from the store, you should follow the included recipe because most traditional store-bought pectins require a certain amount of sugar for them to gel properly. The only difference with Pomona's pectin is that you do have a second ingredient included, and that is calcium powder. You just mix up a half teaspoon calcium water with half cup of water, give it a shake, and your calcium water is ready to use. Any extra can then just get refrigerated for next time. The calcium powder does the job of activating the pectin without the sugar. So for this recipe, I measured out eight cups of grape juice into a large pot. Then I added eight teaspoons of the calcium water to the juice, then add half cup lemon juice, stir well to combine, and then bring to a full boil. While the juice for the grape jelly was heating up, my canned grape juice was done and ready to be removed from the canner. I also combined three cups sugar and three teaspoons pectin powder in a medium bowl. After the juice comes to a boil, slowly mix in the sugar and pectin mixture. Now, for whatever reason this sometimes clumps up on me, maybe I'm not going slow enough, but either way, a quick fix is a few passes with the immersion blender. Now, to clarify, no, you do not have to use this amount of sugar or any sugar, and yes, you can sub a natural sweetener. Because the Pomona's pectin does not require it, this is just the recipe that we like. Okay, so finally, you're going to let the mixture come back to a full boil, and then turn off the heat and start filling your warm jelly jars. Your canner should be hot at this point too. Never pour hot liquid into cold jars or put hot jars into a cold canner or you will end up with broken jars. Every year at some point during the canning season, I end up with a broken jar or two because I rushed this process and didn't make sure that all the temperatures were approximately the same and it is very disappointing to lose a jar of food from a completely preventable problem. Finally, to can the jelly, we just wipe the jar rims Add lids and bands and process in a water bath canner for 10 minutes. If you're new to canning, please grab a beginner canning book or watch a video on the proper steps to water bath canning. After these jars are done processing, they can be removed to cool on a towel for 12 or so hours before removing the bands and storing. Then our grape jelly is done and ready to enjoy all winter long on sourdough toast or peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. The next project was to start canning the broth. This was not a one day project. I started some broth the day prior that was now chilled and ready to can, and over the next few days I would do more batches and can those. Broth must be pressure canned, but it is still very easy as long as you own a pressure canner. I just cool and strain the broth, removing any edible pieces of meat. I'll then throw this chicken into our dinner or make chicken salad sandwiches. The strained broth then needs to be chilled before canning it, and this is because fat doesn't can well. It can cause the lids not to seal properly and will go rancid over time. After it is chilled, all of the fat will be hardened at the top and can easily be scraped off. Then the broth can be heated once again, poured into hot jars, and processed in a pressure canner. I won't go into the step-by-step -step process of pressure canning in this video, but if canning videos are something that you would find helpful, please let me know in the comments below. Now that some of those bigger preserving projects are complete, I want to spend today doing some fall cleanup of our porch and just freshen up the very unfinished entrance to our house so that it at least feels welcoming. I feel like this always drops to the bottom of my priority list, so no more excuses, it's happening today. First, we need to clean off the porch that has become a dumping place from cleaning the van and other projects. I'm also frequently setting things out here that need to go to the dumpster or the shed or somewhere else, so I'm hoping that getting this all cleaned up will inspire me to stop doing that. 
This baby swing was put up years ago now when we built, and it's not only super unattractive, but we currently don't have a child small enough for it. So down it finally comes. I'm thinking that next spring I will hang it on my clothesline I want to build for this baby. Next, I need to stain this part of our porch ceiling that has been bugging me for a long time now. It got put up before I was done with it, and I just never got to getting on a ladder and finishing it. I look a little ridiculous with my big pregnant belly on a ladder, but it was worth it. It feels so much better already. I then swept off the porch and then sprayed down the siding. It gets very dirty from our gravel driveway when we get a strong north wind. And then finally, I pressure washed everything. It is always amazing to me how much different things look after pressure washing them. I didn't even realize our concrete was actually pretty brown before doing this. The deck also had gotten pretty dirty from our pig, George. Long story short, we had a temporary house pig, George, after his mom and litter mates died in a very difficult birth. He was fed on our front porch for a while and made quite the mess. Thankfully, George is now out on the pasture instead of on the porch, so it was time to get it scrubbed and feeling clean again. Once the porch and entrance were clean, I wanted to do a few things to make it feel less unfinished and more welcoming. I had some weed fabric left over from my garden, so we started by weeding out the areas around the house and digging out an area that was too high. Then we put the weed fabric down in the flower beds that never got finished. We then topped the fabric with some fresh mulch and added a few potted mums. I didn't bother to plant them because realistically it's going to freeze and snow here soon, but this will help it feel nice until it does and then I'll plant some more permanent plants next spring. We've lived in our house for a few years now and I cannot believe it took me this long to do this. I think I was always looking for the perfect time and the perfect idea to make it exactly how I wanted. Originally, I couldn't decide between mulch or rocks, but this made me realize that my favorite quote, done is better than perfect, applies to house projects too. Those things, along with a few pots of mums, make this area look so much better. Next up, I added just a few touches to the porch to make it feel like fall. Some pumpkins, a rug I bought online and I will link below, more mums, and a fall wreath. To be perfectly honest, the wreath didn't excite me as much in person as in the picture online, so I'm undecided as to whether it's here to stay. I even found an extra blanket that I could throw over this bench for a cozy fall touch. The pillow was also something I had already, and this bench ended up being the perfect spot. There are definitely a million things I'd like to do to this porch and front entrance in the future, but I'd say this was a pretty good improvement for a few hours of my time and a tight budget. Inside, I wanted to cozy things up a little bit too, but I am, well, I wouldn't say a true minimalist, but I definitely don't like clutter or knickknacks, so I wanted whatever I added to be simple and easy to swap out. I started by bringing in some sunflowers from the garden. All these sunflowers were actually just volunteers from last year. I didn't plant a single one, but I'm glad they grew because they are so bright and beautiful. Inside, I cut them down and arranged them in a large vase. I am definitely not very skilled at flower arranging, but doing this little project inspired me to want to plant more flowers next year so that we can have fresh bouquets all summer. After I got the sunflower arrangement how I wanted it, I pulled out some fall play sets I had bought last year. This alone made the whole kitchen feel brighter and cozier. The kids were very excited when they saw it and asked if we could have a fancy table every night. I actually am going to try to be more intentional about making dinner time feel more special with these little touches. I'm usually eager to just get the meal done and over with, but I will say that little things like placemats and a set table seems to invite a more cozy conversation and time spent at the table instead of everyone just being eager to eat and run. My next decor project was something I had been wanting to do since we built our house. In our previous house in Washington, we had a massive blackboard in the kitchen, and I really enjoyed writing something new on it every season, so one of the projects I planned on doing for quite some time was making one for this dining room wall. I started with some smooth plywood and sprayed it with a few coats of chalkboard paint. I did end up having to sand it once before doing a final coat to make it smooth. I then stained some 1x4 strips of pine, cut them to size, and used wood glue to secure them to the plywood. To the back, I nailed some picture hangers and secured some wire to hang the chalkboard by. It was pretty hard to convince myself to nail a hole into my beautiful shiplap, but I didn't want to risk the chalkboard falling down, and I definitely haven't regretted it. I'm super happy with how it turned out. 
It just needed a little fall design and then it was done. The other touches I added inside were simple, but still helped give it a cozy fall vibe. In the living room, I added some pillows and blankets in fall colors. Swapping out pillow covers is such an easy, minimalist approved decor idea because the covers themselves don't take up much room in storage, and then the pillows are of course practical as well. I just got these covers off of Amazon and I'll link them below. I also added some pine cones, pumpkins, and beeswax candles throughout the house especially in my entryway where I wanted it to feel welcoming. And then in my kitchen where I spend the most time, I used a few fall pieces in this table centerpiece and was really happy with how this all turned out. One of my favorite minimalist decor pieces also got swapped out for fall, and that is my ruggable rug. This thing has been a dream come true for a family of nine who typically has dirty feet from spring to fall and also in a kitchen that is getting consistently used. Washing it is as simple as removing the top and throwing it in the wash. It washes up beautifully and then I just hang it overnight to dry and I could put it back on the next day. Now if you're watching this and wondering how well it stays put given that the top just comes off, I will say I was so impressed with how well it stays put. Now I did upgrade to the premium pad I believe it's called. I'll link it below but it is the more plush pad so it's probably a little heavier but the top stays very well put. It never bunches up or anything like that. It Velcros down really well and holds in place perfectly until you're ready to pull it up and wash it or switch it out for a different one. I've also had fun getting a new cover for each season, so I just grabbed this fall themed one and I love how it adds a pop of color and interest to my otherwise very neutral kitchen. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that peek into our fall days in the farmhouse. It was a very productive week and I hope it inspired you to do some preserving and decorating or just got you in the mood for a simple but cozy fall with your loved ones. We're off to tackle some more preserving projects, but I will see you here next week.